Here we are at Strictly Medicinal Seeds. Today we're going to talk about different seed planting techniques in the Garden of Diversity. There are plants of many types from different environments and they will require different methodologies of seed planting for good success. Diverse garden, diverse planting techniques, diverse seeds. So this is a Chatavri. It's a, a Asparagus racemosus. It's in full fruit right now, and so we'll extract a seed from this. You can see that we have, uh, basically these are droops. They're uh, fruit s surrounding a hard inner seed, and we'll pick one of the droops here. You can see it looks like that. It's red, but you can see the black seed shining through, and then Fruits prohibit germination, so whenever you have a seed in a fruit, then you remove the fruit before you plant the seed. And we'll use this handy t-shirt for that. And there we go, now we've removed the fruit and we see the inner seed. Then an understanding of what a seed is is really helpful. A seed has a seed coat, the testa, that uh, protects the inner parts of the seed, the, the sperm, which is the white portion, and that is the food reserve for the embryo, and the embryo consists of the nascent leaves of the seedling, as well as the root radical. The process of germination is initiated by the water coming in through the testa, the seed coat, and uh, interacting with the life force of the seed, creating hormones which elongate the root radical that pushes through the uh, seed coat, which is softening in the process. There are enzymatic reactions occurring which soften the seed coat and make the nutrients available to the developing seedling. Then the one part that science doesn't really explain is the life force, that spark of life that uh, goes back to the, the beginning of life on planet Earth. We have to trust that the life force will be there and that the seed will develop into the, the vine, the plant, the perennial, the annual, the uh, bush, tree, or liana that it is meant to be. An understanding of the requirements for each particular species is very important. And if you look at the seed company where you're buying your seeds and you see very rote germination instructions, then you can be almost certain that the seed company is not producing their own seeds. We here at Strictly Medicinal Seeds produce our own seeds, especially all the the odd ones and so we give specific instructions both at, in the website in my book growing plant medicine and also in the on the seed packet that you receive in the mail will give you specific instructions so for shatavri which is one of the main female herbs in ayurvedic medicine i make a shatavri uh, cornbread and feed it to my wife in hopes that it will have a, a positive effect on her. And so one of the things about the Chatavri seed is that it has an impermeable seed coat, which means that a little bit of scarification on some sandpaper is going to help. And you can see that now we've rubbed through that impermeable seed coat and the endosperm is showing. So that was a successful scarification. And then it is also a GA3 dependent species. And GA3 is a uh, hormone which exists in natural systems. It is produced by the breakdown of fungi in the substrate. And um, so you can trust that in any good potting soil, there is going to be some gibberellic acid in there. And so a lot of gibberellic acid dependent plants will germinate readily uh, just by using a live potting soil. Not sterilized potting soil, but a live potting soil. Another option is to use a willow water. So 
Here I've made some willow water by soaking a, a willow wand in water and I will put some willow water on this seed and then to plant almost every seed does best if planted right near the surface. Planting seeds too deeply is a big mistake that most people make. There are a few species like ephedra that do better if they're planted deeply. Corn is another one that does well if planted deeply. At the same time, peas are, are wimps. They, they won't germinate through much of a distance of soil at all. So you plant your peas really close to the surface and the same with the vast majority of medicinal herb seeds. You plant them very close to the surface or if there's light dependency involved, then you plant them on the surface and press them in. So here's a Chateauvry flat that I already prepared. We're going to make a very small depression in the surface of the flat. We're going to drop in our prepared seed, cover it up. Everything's wet in Southern Oregon right now. So the potting soil is wet. And then very important tamp that is push down over the top of it a little bit and give it a sense of place. Give it a little, a little security so that it knows which direction to put its radical and which direction to put its plumule. And when you pat, pat down on it, give it, a little, give it a little burst of your own energy, however that comes up for you. It might be chanting the sacred seed syllable, OM, or it might be something very simple like, grow baby, grow, or any kind of positive thoughts that you put into the plant will then uh, initiate that life process in a very positive manner. So now what we're uh, talking about is the process of scarification, which is the scoring or nicking of the impermeable seed coat. And there are a number of different species, including a lot of Lamiaceae, that is the mint family, also Fabaceae, th those are the the uh, legumes and also tropical trees like tamarind. These trees have impermeable seed coats and uh, oftentimes the the dissemination strategy is that an animal is eating the fruit uh, then accidentally ingesting the seed and then the stomach acids work on the seed coat and then the seed is expulsed somewhere far away and germinates accordingly. Well, the species that I worked with um, for demonstrating the scarification is Chinese licorice, Glyceriza urolensis. And what I did was um, last night I scarified some on a seed cleaning screen and then I soaked them. So I'll demonstrate how the original stratification occurred. Why use the seed cleaning screen? This is a number seven screen. You can choose the seed cleaning screen that is just a little bit too small for the seed to go through. But what it's going to do is it's going to hold the seed in place. And then also these rims here are going to keep the seed from being uh, unintentionally disseminated into the environment, which is a way that seeds are often lost. And some of those seeds that are lost actually germinate and grow better than the ones that you intentionally planted, but you can't really rely on that. So let's pour the seeds into the seed cleaning screen and then use the coarse grit sandpaper to rub around on them and get them all into one spot and then give it a really good solid rub. And different species are going to react differently. So some will require more elbow grease and some will uh, actually grind, be ground into powder, which obviously is not a good idea. So you want to check while you're, while you're uh, doing your work with the sandpaper and see, make sure that you're not grinding the seeds to powder. And <coughs> depending on how hard they are, and these are real hard, They're members of the Fabaceae, the legume family. 
So you want to give them a really good rub. And then what I like to do is take them afterwards and put them underneath my dissecting microscope and look and see what kind of striations have occurred on the testa. But we're not going to do that process right now. Instead, we're going to return these to their packet and see by using the seed cleaning screen, which is something that we manufacture here at Strictly Medicinal Seeds and has diverse uses, then we didn't waste any of the seeds. They're all right back in where they came from. These normally would be soaked in plain water overnight because there's no gibberellic acid dependency with licorice. And so these are the ones that I soaked. And let's look at them. Okay, so some have swollen significantly. Those are the ones that were properly scarified. Some are still the same size as they were to start with. Those are the ones that did not get properly scarified. So to do this really thoroughly, what you could do would be to scarify, soak overnight, then plant the ones that blew up and got big and re-scarify the small ones and soak them overnight again and plant them again the next day. So it would take you a couple of days to complete the planting. I'm going to take some of these swollen seeds and plant them. And this is a situation where you want to use a fast draining medium. You look at where the plant is from, and this is a Mediterranean based plant. It grows around the shores of the Mediterranean and it grows in calcareous uh, uh, alkaline soils that are very poor in nutrients. It's a legume. It makes its own nutrients through fixing atmospheric nitrogen. And so we want to use a fast draining medium. So you can see that my medium here is full of uh, uh, pumice and sand. And then I just put a little depression <clears throat> in each cell. So this time we're, we're working with a flat that has cells in it instead of working with a deep flat where we were doing the three row methodology. Why is that? Well, cells are useful in a way. Uh, they allow us to distribute the seed very evenly and they also are very useful for seeds that need fast drainage because the edges of these pots are natural spots where the water drains down and out. A lot of people use bottom heat and so they put these these flats on a plastic thing that gives bottom heat. And the heat can be useful in certain cases, but the fact that there is no drainage is a real problem. Because when you water the flat, what you want is for the water to course over the seed and go away. The seed then will swell, and then as it dries, as the surface dries, the seed will contract a little bit. And then when you water again, the seed will swell again. If it's just in ever moist soil, it doesn't do the expansion and contraction. And it's through expansion and contraction that you get the magic of germination. So don't do that. Keep this flat on a slatted surface, just like the slats that you see on this table that I built over here with the flats above so that there's drainage out the bottom. Big, really important point. Seems silly. It's one of the most important things that you can know and it's one of the biggest mistakes that people make. So I'm taking little pinches and I'm tossing them down into my depressions. Why am I not just putting one seed in each depression? Because I know that you can't trust every seed to come up. That just requires too much faith. I don't have that much faith get that little tossing. You need to do that because otherwise they're going to cloy and stick to your fingers. 
Some are going down deeply into the pit and some are adhering to the sides and the surface. That's okay. You never know which one is going to come up. But one thing that's absolutely for sure, and we ended up really nicely at the end of this, pop a few of these back down into their pits. One thing that you know for sure is that you're going to cover it so that the seeds are barely covered. And then you're going to tamp it. Don't forget to tamp. People report to me that seeds that I know to be of high germination failed to germinate for them. And the first question I ask is, did you tamp? And the standard answer is, what's that? So no to tamp. If you're gonna camp, you better tamp. And if it's light dependent, bring a lamp. Okay, so that is uh, um, a good introduction to scarification. And now we would set this flat underneath the lights, close underneath the T5 lights so that it gets a lot of light from above and we could expect germination to be very rapid after we've uh, soaked the seeds like that. You wouldn't want to leave the soaked seeds in a cool, moist place for a long time. They would rot. Once you soak them and they've swollen up, it's time to get them warm in medium so they can germinate. Let's go over to the to the lights and look at some germinating seeds underneath the lights. Okay, so this is precisely what I have in mind for the licorice flat. I'm going to put it underneath the lights really close so that it gets heat from above, just like the sun gives us heat from above. And this is uh, actually a, a mandrake flat that I just planted. Here's a, here's a seed that made its way to the surface. That's a mandragora Turcomonica seed, and I can see that, oops, here we go. When you're a seeds person and you drop a seed, you automatically stop everything else and just widen your view and find the spot where the seed dropped, and then you get it back. So you can see that the radical is already beginning to swell and exude from that, from that seed. And it's only been in these conditions for a short period of time. I'm going to replant this one. And now I'm going to come over to this flat over here, which has been uh, extant for another week. And I'm going to pull a exemplary So you can see how this was planted in the fast draining. These were so these seeds were soaked overnight in willow water because the um, moonflower, which is uh, Datura inoxia, is a GA3 dependent species, and the the um, willow water contains gibberellic acid. And you can see how I tossed them down into that little pit, and there's one that's already germinated and is showing its first cotyledon leaves. Those are not true leaves, those are cotyledon leaves. This is an epigeal germinator. And then you can see these, we call these goosenecks. You can see these little goosenecks of other ones. So I had thrown at least four seeds in there and they're all germinating in concert. If you listen very carefully, you can hear the music. This is a demonstration of how to nick a large seed. So with small seeds, in order to scarify, you rub on sandpaper. For larger seeds, they should be individually nicked. Now here's a tamarind seed, Tamarindus indicus, comes from the uh, continent of India. And if you look at a, a seed, uh, there's always going to be a point of attachment to the embryo. Um, this is called the hilum, and it's a place where water can get in because it's soft. It's kind of like that little 
place in the top of your head where your cranium doesn't really quite come together. That's for your spirit to go out when you die or for your spirit to come in when you're born. And you don't want to nick the seed where th there's the hilum because that's a very sensitive spot. And if you nick it there, then you're liable to damage the embryo. And if you damage the embryo, then the seed's gonna be no good. So you go somewhere off to the side and you just remove a little slice. See, these were soaked overnight, so they're nice and, they're nice and uh, soft. So you remove a little slice and then a, d a big seed like that, I like to, I like to put tropical tree seeds in gallon pots with a fast draining soil. This was a tamarind seven seed packet. So I put one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So there were seven seeds in a seven seed packet. I like to check things like that from time to time. And now let's get another one. Find where the hilum is. Make a little nick. See, when I nicked that, I didn't really get the white endosperm showing through. So I'm going to go a little bit deeper. There we go. And there's the endosperm showing through. And so that one's ready, and I'm going to plant that right next to this other one. After a while, you get kind of into a rhythm with this. And I like to plant seeds with my right hand. It's, it's, it's this whole African thing. In Africa, th these are called mkwaju. And it's a um, full-size tropical tree. And I was taught by the African people to always give money or anything that's uh, significant, like, uh, for instance, uh, shaking hands, always with the right hand. Because according to African tradition, at least in the parts of East Africa that I am from, uh, as having lived there for three or four years and become one with the with the people uh, the left hand is the hand of the devil and the right hand is the hand of, of holiness so you always give money with the right hand otherwise you're uh, likely to be doing the wrong kind of thing with your money so then you cover those they're buried well, the rule is that you bury seeds as deep as they are wide. So the Jordan River is deep and wide. But anyway, uh, so it would go in about as, as fairly, fairly deeply since they're fairly big seeds. And then again, tamp and put your good intentions in there. This could be put anywhere in the greenhouse. It needs to be warm and germination will occur again rather rapidly. Does it work? Why, yes, it works. We have tamarind trees. Where's a good tamarind tree that I can find for you? There's a tamarind tree. Isn't it kind of magic that from such a small seed, such a viable tree can occur? It says tamarus, tamarindus indicus do not sell. This brings up something that is a uh, practice on our farms, which is the mother plant concept. We grow mother plants of, of the greatest possible vitality so that in eventuality they can be seed bearing individuals and uh, we grow many of them and that way uh, you can have sufficient genetic diversity to keep the population viable so we grow tamarind trees and the tamarind trees come from the tamarind seeds and sometimes we have to wait a really long time. <laughs> One of the challenges that people often uh, ask me about is how to work with very small seeds. And so I thought that I'd give a demonstration on planting a standard three row flat which is one of the ways that we work with seed planting here. There are no cells in the flat. It's just a deep flat filled with standard potting soil. And so to start with, you work up the surface and make sure that the, the flat should be filled all the way to the top because the only direction that potting soil is gonna go in the future is down. 
and you want your cake to be nice and fluffy and and uh, 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 up to the up to the surface. So here we are with that, and then this is the very small seed that we've chosen for today because we're going to begin our Artemisia annua planting for the year. Uh, Artemisia annua or sweet annie is specific for treating malaria. Uh, so so it is a uh, very well uh, established medicinal herb. The World Health Organization recommends the use of Artemisia annua and uh, true to its name it is an annual and it is very has very very fine seed so that's probably a couple thousand seeds there and whenever you're planting seeds you know they don't all come up so you want to plant more than you are going to require and given the size and the potency of an herb like this you don't really need very many of them I need quite a few because we pot them up and sell them to our customers so when you get a small seed like that then it's very difficult to uh, take a pinch of it and give a real even distribution in the three row flat so we're going to take some of this impossibly wet sand that we got from outside and mix it in with the seed and what that does is it uh, creates a little bit of distance between the seeds and stretches the the uh, volume of the planting a little bit so that it makes it easier to distribute evenly. And I would recommend normally to use a dry sand for this process, even though I'm using a really clumpy wet sand right now, this is going to work. So on the three row flat, first establish where the rows are going to go by making some in this case very shallow furrows. A lot of your very small seed is light dependent. That means that it needs sunlight, which just came through to the flat right now, which is a very good sign. It needs light in order to germinate. There's a uh, substance known as phytochrome that's inside the seed coat, and it's like an on-off switch. When light comes, the phytochrome uh, allows the germination of the seed and when there is no light the phytochrome disallows the the uh, germination of the seed this is important in nature because a lot of seeds lie dormant in the uh, seed bank deep within the soil for decades even small seeds like this will lie dormant for decades because of this uh, photo dependence and then when there's some disturbance and light comes to the seed then it can successfully germinate and grow so nature has its own way of making certain that seeds are not wasted and that seeds grow when there is a situation where the seeds the plants are needed and where it's very likely that there will be good results if the seed germinates 16 inches deep in the ground there won't be any results because it won't have the energy to get up to the light if it germinates on the surface of the soil during the spring rains then it'll be just fine it'll produce a nice big Christmas tree like Artemisia annua so we mustn't forget our tamping technique I'm going to scooge this out a little bit because it was so lumpy and clumpy but this is good this is our three rows and then we tamp them down see how is I'm tamping right into the surface the amount of burial that exists is mostly just the sand that I added to the seed which is good because it means that some of it is right on the surface and some of its barely under the surface and depending on what kinds of environmental factors occur during the germination phase the slightly better buried ones may have a better chance than the ones that are right on the surface or vice versa. Depends on how much moisture they get and what the temperature uh, uh, oscillations are. So there's a standard three row flat planted with Artemisia annua. I'll label it with my, with my seed packet for now um, because 
I don't want you to have to sit through me making a tag. Let's put this down here. And here's a demo on what a three row flat looks like after some time. This was planted 1128. So it was planted about 15 days ago. This is Lobelia. It was uh, planted on the surface and pressed in in a three row system. Uh, just like we just did the Artemisia annua and this is what has resulted. You can see that the, the uh, three rows are still evident although there's been some mixing because of seeds floating around when the flat gets watered and so forth and so on. Um, sometimes when you go to choose the seedling that you're actually going to prick out into a new pot after it's grown on uh, sufficiently actually the ones that are not exactly in the row are the biggest ones and the best and that is typical to the garden of diversity we have our human wishes our plans our foibles and we uh, rely on grace to really uh, give us what we need so we can understand all the science we can physically do the planting properly. We can have viable seeds, which all of our seeds at Strictly Medicinal Seeds are tested in natural conditions to make sure that we're giving you viable seeds. But without grace, where would we be? The whole place could fall down because of a storm. Through grace and hard work and a lot of prayer uh, through the last windstorms, the greenhouses are all intact. So that is a standard three row flat. We'll grow these on until they make their second set of true leaves and then we'll prick them to pots and continue the process. So here we are in the shade house and for the most part the value of the shade house is in overwintering flats of seeds that are very slow germinators that require stratification in order to germinate. So stratification is giving the seed a period of cold, moist conditions so that the immature embryo can sufficiently develop in order to uh, then go into the next phase of germination. So uh, there are a lot of species that require cold stratification because in nature uh, seeds are made during the summer and they dehiss in the fall and then they lie in the substrate through the winter and then they germinate in the spring. It's the standard natural uh, way that that uh, uh, Mother Nature has decided to uh, uh, cue the germination into the timing where conditions are right for growth. So here we have a standard three row flat again and these are Angelica Archangelica. Angelica Archangelica is a biennial which is a big and powerful uh, medicinal herb, a uh, flavoring agent, uh, a febrifuge, and a really, a really good one to use um, to combine with other herbs. It has a, a strong carminative effect. This is a powerful herb from the European tradition. So the flat was planted in, in a three row method. Uh, basically very close to the surface. This uh, light dependent germinator. Seeds were pressed in and left out in the shade house for 60 days and then brought into the greenhouse for germination. So this is a very standard cycle. Uh, if you don't have a greenhouse and you do have a shade house, then you just leave the flat out in the shade house and in the spring, the seedlings are going to come up So now let's look at cold conditioning in the refrigerator. Well, 
lacking a proper outdoor facility for stratification of seeds, you're forced to use the refrigerator method. And the refrigerator method involves taking the dry seeds, putting them in a plastic bag with some moist medium, either sand, or in this case, this was cocoa coir, which I really like. Uh, neutral in pH, very hydrophilic, um, works well for, for this particular process. And the plant that we're looking at here is True Comfrey, Symphytum officinale, and there you can get a close-up of what the seeds look like after they've been soaked in medium in the fridge for a while. And it doesn't take very long on these. They could, could do well with a uh, couple of days to a couple of weeks in the 40 degrees Fahrenheit. That's refrigeration, right? Now we're using this, this flat, the side of the flat, where the soil is standard potting soil. So there's a lot of compost in here. There are some fast draining ingredients like sand added, but it's high in nutrients and the soil structure will cloy to the seed, which is fine for comfrey. Because if you think about comfrey, where comfrey grows, it wants to grow in your compost pile where everything's really fresh and green and yucky and and the the process of uh, deterioration of of vegetal matter into a uh, a form that can be uptaken by plants is fully fully uh, uh, fully relevant so it doesn't matter oh i dropped one it doesn't matter you can you can plant comfrey in pure compost. It'll do fine, that's what it wants. It's not a legume, it's, it's a borage family plant. It doesn't make its own nutrients. It takes nutrients from the subsurface, fixes them in its leaves, and only through the deterioration of the leaf and the root does it move those nutrients back into the environment. So again, I'm taking little pinches and I'm putting them right in the middle of these cells and that's going to be very useful for whoever has to work with this next because they'll know what is the comfrey seed because all the comfrey seeds are coming up in the center and what is a weed seed perhaps if they're not familiar with what comfrey looks like when it germinates they can tell what it is by where it comes up if more than one comes up in the middle of these cells then they can just be depotted and separated. So it's better to err on planting a few too many seeds than it is on having excessive faith and planting only one seed per cell. So once again, we cover. The seeds are just barely subsurface. And we tamp on every cell. and put our good intentions in there. This can be left in the greenhouse. Germination will be eight to 10 days on these. If you fail to cold condition, you might eventually get some results, especially if you're using like a cold greenhouse. But the reality is cold conditioning really, really works. So the final bit that we're going to do here is we're going to pot up a seedling. And I chose this meadow sweet, Spirea omeria. And this is in the family Rosaceae, the rose family. You can usually tell the Rosaceae because they have these really heavily dentate leaves. Well, this flat is really kind of cool. It shows something about seeds. It was planted on September 1st of last year and now we're, we're in January of the new year and some of the seeds came right up 
and those are represented by these larger individuals here. But this is an example of pulse germination, where then later, just a few weeks ago, the majority of the rest of the seeds that were planted in this flat germinated on a different schedule. So what this means is don't discard your flats too soon. You may well get a very low germination rate and then months later you can get more. So here's the one that's speaking out to me and I'm going to stick my finger in right next to it and go well underneath and make sure that I've really got the root because we're more concerned about the root than we are about the aerial parts. The aerial parts are replaceable. The root is not. And when I hold it, then I hold the crown of the plant and I put the roots down my, down my fingers here so that I'm not creating stress at this important crown of the plant area. And this is also going to make it easy for me to introduce the roots and mass into my pot. I like these little green pots. Green is my favorite color. And so um, this has a, uh, by the way, this is a spreading root system, not a tap root. So we introduce the roots right down in there and we leave the crown of the plant right at the surface of the pot and then push in around and allow the particles of potting soil to fall down into the hole and gather around the spreading root system and lock it into a more or less natural shape. You don't want it to be all in a clump and you don't want it to be J-rooted. And then you press in all around and put your good intentions in there one more time. And the little Spirea omeria, the little meadow sweet is so happy and you can also think about the medicine. Um, what medicine is this going to give people? Well, it has salicylic acid, doesn't it? So it's a pain reliever. And there is so much pain in the world these days. If as herbalists we can ameliorate some of the pain with our good herbs, then that's a very good path to walk upon.